the word of the Lord, Luke chapter 24. The, um, your Bible might have a title for it, uh, might, might call it the road to Emmaus or the Emmaus disciples, um, and we'll be focusing on that story as we get ready for tonight. Before we do that, I just want to, uh, I want for you for, for a second just to imagine with me um, this scene. And one of the things that I've loved uh, just being raised in this church is that, uh, you know, being raised under the teaching of my dad, who is a, a fantastic storyteller. You know, he's a great storyteller. Um, and um, one of the things that I've learned is it's so great to be in a place where you can visualize what's happening in God's Word, right? Because it, it makes the scene alive and allows us to pick up on details that we might have otherwise forgotten if we just allowed it to stay as black words on a white piece of paper. Um, so imagine this with me for a second. Imagine it's dark outside. It's Sunday, the day that rumor has it Jesus got up from the dead. And you haven't seen the risen Christ, but you heard about it, and all of a sudden now you experienced him. And it's pitch black, and you can't see anything. The only thing that's outside, because they didn't have street lights at the time, would have been the light from the moon and the stars. You had already walked a full day's journey, seven miles. You sat down to eat, but you didn't finish your meal because you recognized the presence of Christ. And you went running another seven miles back to Jerusalem because the disciples had to know that Jesus is indeed alive. That's the scene that we find ourselves in, in Luke chapter 24. It's the appearance of Jesus to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Let's read the story together. Starting in verse 13. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And I want you to pay attention to each word that's present here in the text. Uh, Tonight, when we have an opportunity to be here in God's house, Studying God's Word. We call tonight Bible study. It's an opportunity where we can take a minute to break down the text and look at every single word and understand the meaning and what's happening here. So I want you to engage right now that mind that you have that asks questions in order to get to a deeper understanding. Do you know that uh, my dad and I were talking the other day and we were talking about what allows someone to be, what allows someone to be smart? How do we get to the point where somebody is called smart? And we were just throwing some ideas around back and forth. And, and one of the conclusions we came to is a smart person isn't necessarily somebody who just has a lot of information. Because nobody was just born with a lot of information. Right? Um, but you get that way by asking questions. Because you look at something and you're not just fine with what you see, but you want to go deeper and you want to ask questions. Why? How did that come to pass? Or you read something and all of a sudden your mind starts to say, what's going on here? What do I need to know in order to understand this more fully, right? So as you're reading the text here, verse 13, it says, now on that same day, what same day? Well, if you read the passage right before it, you'll recognize that it's the passage where all of a sudden the disciples and uh, Mary a- had discovered that there was an empty tomb. So they're talking about Easter. They're talking about that first Easter. They're talking about Sunday, the resurrection day, two days after Jesus was crucified on the cross and he's alive. And so when it says on that same day, we're talking about Sunday. Is everybody with me so far? So on that same day, two of them. Now the next question you might ask is, who is them? Right? Two of two of who? Two of them. Two of. You got to read. You kind of got to look a little bit deep to find what they're talking about. But there's a passage or a verse there in verse ten that says that uh, that they told this to the apostles or to the disciples. If you go back even further and you look at verse nine or verse eight and nine, it says, "Then they remembered his words and re- returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest." All them to the eleven and to all the rest. Who's the eleven? The eleven are the disciples of Jesus. Judas isn't around any longer because he betrayed Jesus and he hung himself. And so he's dead. He's no longer there. There's just eleven of them. And it says, and to all the rest. So this is the group that it's referring to when we get into verse 13. And it says, on the same day, which is Sunday, uh, the, uh, two of them, them would have been these close followers of Jesus. Right? On the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. Here's another thing that's insignificant about this verse before we move on to verse 14. 
So they're walking from Jerusalem to this place called Emmaus, which is seven miles away from Jerusalem. It's two of the followers of Christ, and it's on Sunday. And they're walking, and as they're walking, I want you to recognize that they had gone to Jerusalem not to see Jesus be crucified. The reason why the crowds were in Jerusalem, because it was Passover. And at Passover, everyone would travel, everyone from around the area would travel and make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate this Jewish tradition of the Passover. What is the Passover, if you might ask? The Passover is the time to remember what God did when he delivered his people out of Egypt. And so when he uh, spoke to Moses and called Moses, you know, from a burning bush and told him to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let the people go. And, and all of a sudden the 10 plagues happened and, and sure enough, God showed up. And with the, with the word of God says in Exodus, with, the, with a mighty uh, hand and a strong arm, God reached down and delivered his people out of Egypt. And because he did that, then every year after that, they would remember God's salvation act and that was called the passover it's called the passover if you remember because the last plague was the eldest male of every household right would uh would be killed by the angel of death unless there was blood of a lamb sprinkled over the doorpost of that particular house so do you guys tracking with me so far i know that i kind of really quickly just went into some old testament history and so if you're not familiar with it, it might sound very unfamiliar to you, but I would encourage you, if what I just shared with you is very new, then, then I want to encourage you to read the book of Exodus. It's the second book of the Bible, right at the beginning, right after Genesis, and everything that I just shared with you will make more sense after that. For those of you that are fairly vaguely familiar with that passage and you want to refresh your memory, it, it, as we're in this season of still celebrating the death and resurrection of Christ, that happening in the middle of a Passover week 2,000 years ago, then it would be significant if we want to understand the cross to understand what's going on at Passover. Does that make sense? Jesus himself was a Jew. He comes out of a Jewish tradition and the whole story about how to follow Christ. Jesus didn't come to present a new God, but he was simply uh, re reminding people of who this God has been the whole time, right? And it's interesting that, you know, the, in order for the house to, 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 for the angel of death to pass over a particular house, there had to be the blood of an innocent lamb over their doorposts. And, and what gives us salvation of our sin? It's the blood of an innocent lamb on the cross of Calvary. And so there's so much similarity and, and, com, and comparison that we can see that's taking place between what happens in the Old Testament and what happens in the New Testament. So some people say, man, I only like to read the New Testament because it makes sense and talks about Jesus. But the Old Testament, man, it gets me all confused and I don't really know. What I would say is, well, if, it, it, if it's difficult, then stick with it. Don't give up on it. Because if we understand what's happening there, then, then we can understand Jesus so much. In fact, Jesus' name in Hebrew means Yeshua, which is the same name of Joshua in the Old Testament. Who was Joshua? Another one that would come and would deliver God's people. And so there's so much just similarity. If we want to know Jesus, then you can't know Jesus without knowing the Old Testament. And so as we get here in verse 13, it says, On the same day, two of them, two of the disciples, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles away from Jerusalem. But they were leaving on a Sunday, going back to Emmaus. In other words, they had been in Jerusalem probably Friday and Saturday and already decided to leave. That's significant because the Passover celebration is usually seven days long. How, how long is it, church? I'm just checking to see if you're with me. How long is a Passover celebration? But these guys are gone after three. Two and a half. Why? Good question. I don't know. The Bible doesn't really tell us, but it's something to know, right? So uh, while Passover is still happening in Jerusalem, they're gone. They're out of here. They're dejected, right? They were followers of Jesus. Jesus just got crucified on the cross, so they are, they are sad. Watch, even the scripture tells us that they're sad. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. And talking with each other about all these things that had happened. What things that had happened? They're talking about Jesus being taken to the cross. They're talking about Jesus being sentenced, being arrested. They're talking about Jesus uh, hanging there on the cross for everyone to see. They're talking about Jesus dying. They're talking about all the things that had taken place. Verse 15. And... While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. I want us to pause there for a second. 
While they were talking, talking about what? What happened to Jesus? They were a little bit disappointed. They thought that something was going to happen where, you know, Jesus, they were waiting for Jesus to like miraculously float off the cross and say, ha ha, fooled you, you can't kill me. They're waiting for Jesus to do something powerful, and yet all of a sudden they see him hanging there limp with the Roman soldiers carrying him to his grave, and all of a sudden now they are saddened. They are discouraged. They are broke down. They are tired. They, they're, they're, their eyes are probably swollen from crying. Their voices are probably gone from screaming, and here they are talking with each other about what had taken place in that moment. And then Jesus himself came near and walked with them. I want to remind us for a second, church, that, that oftentimes, you know, it can be really easy for us to think that, um, you know, hey, uh, you know, are you ready to give your life over to Jesus? Oh, uh, no, you know what, man? I need to tighten some things up in my life first, and then, and then I'll welcome him into my house, right? Like, we, we think like Jesus is a guest uh, that's coming over our house to where we have to make sure everything looks nice and neat in order for him to come in and make his residence in our life. But, but Scripture reminds me here that Jesus comes alongside his disciples when they're at a very low point. Jesus comes along his, his disciples when they are confused. Some of us might think, oh man, I need to have my faith all lined up. I need to have the Bible memorized in order for Jesus to look favorably upon me. But here these guys are asking doubtful questions about Jesus, and he shows up next to them. Some of us are like, man, you know, I'm afraid, you know, uh, God doesn't love me. God doesn't, you know, he doesn't like where I'm at right now because, man, I don't need, right now, I'm, I'm struggling with my faith. I'm struggling with whether or not uh, I believe in Jesus. Man, look at everything that's happening around my life. It looks like things are falling apart. You know, ever since I started going to church, I thought everything was going to get better, but all of a sudden, now I'm seeing more problems arise. Some of my family members are rejecting me. Some are looking at me strange. My coworkers are treating me differently. People are posting fun pictures of things they do on Sundays, and I'm going to church, and I'm getting kind of jealous now. I'm wishing that I, and, you know, I didn't have that commitment anymore. And, and you start thinking of all these different things and doubts and worries and whether or not it's worth it to follow Jesus. And here these guys are walking along this road, right, considering what had taken place with Jesus and, and not in a very good place. And they weren't like speaking in tongues and calling down the Holy Spirit. These guys were like, man, who do you think Jesus really was? You think he's really the Messiah, man? Because I thought he was. I mean, remember what he did? He did all those miracles. Nobody could do those miracles. But, but if he was really the Messiah, you think he would have just died on the cross like that? You know, they're talking to each other, asking these questions. And, and, and while they're in that place, Jesus himself came near and went with them. You know, it's a pretty powerful thing. Here's another thing that uh, stands out to me about this passage. You know, because we're going to continue reading, and you'll see that Jesus walked with them, and he walked quite a ways with them, right? Then he sits down with them, and then he eats with them. And, man, it took them a long time to realize that they were with Jesus. Right? And, uh, and, and I, I want to bring this up because, you know, uh, there might be somebody here tonight who you're not really in a place where you can say honestly within your heart that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. Maybe you haven't even given your life to Jesus yet. But, you, but you're here. And you're like, man, I, I don't know yet if I'm a Christian, but I'm, I, I feel like I'm getting closer. I, I feel like I'm learning more, and I'm getting to a place where I could fully give God all my faith and all my trust and all my life. I'm not there yet, but, but I'm getting close. And what I want to say is this. Um, as I look at this passage, you know, it's very different. Oftentimes, people will take two distinct stories of how Jesus appears so that we can understand the different ways that Jesus is working in our lives. You know, when Jesus appeared to Paul, remember his name was Saul, and he was on his way to go persecute Christians to Damascus, and he was just going on his way, and all of a sudden Jesus showed up, and boom! Big bright light shone from above. You hear the voice of God saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And right there in that moment, right, he is turned around, transformed. He was on his way to kill Christians. Next thing you know, he gets up. He, when the scales from his eyes uh, fall off, now he's going to make Christians. And it's this instantaneous conversion experience where Jesus shows up and it radically transforms his life. And you know what? There's some people in here that have a testimony about how God has worked in your life that was an instantaneous, I used to be this way, Jesus showed up, and boom, I completely changed. And you know what I want to say? Praise God for your testimony. But not every, everybody's testimony is that way. 
right? And for those that maybe don't have that, it doesn't mean that the way God is working in your life isn't, isn't as significant as the way that he has radically, maybe instantaneously changed somebody else's life. You know, in Paul's case, he just turned around right there in an instant. Lightning showed up, big voice. It was loud. It was, man, that thing was just like, boom, right? And in the case of these guys, Jesus just walked alongside them. What's up, guys? Oh, what's up, man? Who are you? Well, you know. And he walks with them, and it takes them a while to recognize that Jesus is there. You know, for some people, it takes them a while to recognize that Jesus is there. You know, some family members that you might have that you've been praying for, and and you're worried that the first time they came to church with you, they didn't accept Jesus, and you're like, oh, man, failure. I was for sure that that one worship song was going to get them, man. Because it was, man, the, the, the electric guitar solo was on point. It was, like the, it was like the Holy Spirit came over and took over Benny and just started hitting that top string, right? And I was like, yeah, this is it right here. And they just walked out like, meh. And you're, you're discouraged. Oh, man, I was for sure they were going to give their life to Jesus tonight or this Sunday or, or last year. But Jesus is right there. And that's the thing about this passage that I love, man. There are times when Jesus will show up and things are going to change like that. And there are moments when he's going to just walk. Right? These guys are walking together. They're talking together. They're, they're asking questions. Their heads are down. They're, they're downcast. They're discouraged. And Jesus himself came near and went with them. Have you ever been discouraged, church? Has Jesus ever come alongside and walked with you? Right? Um, have you ever been at a point where you're asking a lot of questions, right? Uh, uh, don't worry about it. It's all right. Because, you know, who knows? Maybe like these guys, Jesus will walk alongside and start asking you some questions back. Jesus himself came near and went with them. Verse 16. But their eyes were kept from recognizing them or him. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. You know, some people... Um, there's two explanations, two general explanations that, could t- that can explain what's happening in verse 16, right? Um, some of you would like, man, I would recognize it if Jesus walked up right next to me. What are these fools can't recognize Jesus, man? What's wrong with them, right? Um, there's two explanations as to what can happen here. There's like the, the spiritual explanation and there's a the physical explanation. The spiritual explanation would go along with how the scripture says it here and says their eyes were kept from recognizing them, which we can interpret as they were somehow, some way, God uh, uh, caused them to be unable to recognize Jesus, right? So I don't know if he, like, made him look like someone else, or I don't know what God did, you know? Um, The other explanation is a physical explanation, which is maybe they didn't recognize Jesus because of how bad he was beaten. Maybe they didn't recognize who he was because he didn't look like himself very much. I just got a text message about 30 minutes ago from my brother-in-law who does MMA fighting, right? Or he doesn't really do it. He trains, and that's his way of getting exercise. But every once in a while, you catch an elbow from somebody. And he sends me a picture of him, and this whole side of his face, you can't even recognize him. It's like black and blue and real swollen. His eye is completely shut. And if I didn't know who he was, you know, it would be really difficult for me to recognize him if the only thing I saw was his right eye. And Jesus went through an even worse beating than what? my brother-in-law did in that little MMA training session that he went through. So that's another explanation of it. Either way, regardless, the story tells us that they couldn't tell that it was Jesus. And so we go on. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you were walking along? And they stood still, looking sad. So they stopped in their tracks. You know, this guy asked them a question. They're like, you know, hey, what are you guys talking about, man? And they stood still, looking sad. And then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him. He said, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? You know, he, like, he looks at him. He's like, what? What, are you ta- what do you mean, what are we talking about? Where do you, you come from, bro? You don't know what just happened in Jerusalem? You haven't heard about what they did to Jesus over there? And, and Jesus is kind of playing dumb, you know, just trying to figure out what they're going through and what they're experiencing and wanting to hear what they have to say. In, in verse 19, he says, uh, well, what things? And then they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Let me read that one more time. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. 
I mean, this summarizes the entire uh, 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 sentiment and mindset of every disciple at this time. We thought he was going to be the Messiah. Notice the wording there. The wording wasn't, Jesus is the Messiah, but now we don't know what to do. It was, Jesus is no longer the Messiah, because we thought he was supposed to be the Messiah, but what happened on the cross is evidence to us that he cannot be God's Messiah. And so they're in a place right now of doubt. They're in a place of completely going backward and thinking that Jesus was just a man, a good man, a man who taught and got caught up with the wrong people at the wrong time, and all of a sudden now we'll remember him, but, you know, oh well, life goes on. Let's go back to Emmaus. Right? They're, they're at this place, and they're like, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, verse, the second part of verse 21, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some of the women, women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see him. Let me pause there for a second. So these guys, you know, give Jesus the explanation about Jesus. Um, they're, they're talking to him and saying what had happened to him. And Jesus is listening to them and the way that they're interpreting it, right? The way that they're interpreting what had gone down. Uh, how many of us know that it's significant in our lives the way that we interpret what happens? Uh, oftentimes, there's a wiring that we have in our minds. There's a way that we perceive. There's a way that we understand events and things around us that cause us to then interpret and then make conclusions about what is happening. And believe it or not, we are not as objective as we think we are. You know, we think we could just tell it like it is and say the facts and say what had happened. But in reality, there's something within us, in our heart and in our mind, that allows us to see something and then naturally interpret it uh, based on how we're wired to interpret. Let me give you an example of, of this type of thinking. You know, if somebody of faith, you know, might come into a particular place and, and when you have a, a negative thing happen to you, right? Some of us might, you know, if you're a person of faith, you might say, you know what, God closed the door. And we say that God might have closed this door because he might be opening a different door. Somebody that is not of faith, if they come into a situation where that takes place, they'll say, you know what? I didn't get lucky today. I guess today just wasn't my day. Same event took place, two different interpretations as to what's going on. And it's all, depend it's all determined upon how we are uh, conditioned, how we are ready and prepared to take what had taken place and make sense of it. And in our lives, oftentimes, we can be, a, you know, I know for me, sometimes I can be a little bit cynical, and I, I can try to make sense of what's happening, but do it in a way that leaves God out. And what these guys were doing here in their explanation to Jesus was they were explaining the events that took place on the cross, but they left God out. They said, man, all this stuff took place, but, you know, man, three days and all this kind of stuff, but, you know, now we're just kind of confused and dazed and going back to Emmaus, and we don't really know what to do. So Jesus then, in verse 25, says, Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And I love what it says here in verse 27. It says, Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. So Jesus, you know, he walks with them, he hears their explanation, and then he says, let me give you another explanation, guys. See, what took place was, you thought that the person who was coming to redeem you had failed, but in reality, what happened two days ago was all these prophecies and everything that God had been talking about coming to a conclusion so that you can see that I am the Son of God. Open your eyes, guys. So you, in, physically, you haven't been able to recognize that it was me. And spiritually, you didn't recognize that on the cross that has been God all along. Open up your eyes and recognize that this is me. 
that I'm right here in this particular situation. He explains it to them. I love that it says here in this text that he went all the way back to Moses and to the prophets, right? He went all the way back to the Passover to explain, hey, guys, isn't it Passover right now? Don't you get it? The blood of a lamb, innocent lamb, had to go over the doorpost. And so the blood of an innocent lamb had to go over the cross so that people's sins could be forgiven, that the angel of death would pass over and that there would be salvation to that household. Don't you understand that that's me? Don't you understand that? That you have life now because of what I've done for you? And he explains to them from Moses through the prophets and, and goes into great detail. And again, like I mentioned at the beginning of tonight, how significant it was for Jesus to be able to quote to them what takes place in the Old Testament. In other words, if anybody tries to tell you, you know what, I'm done with the Old Testament, I just focus on the New Testament because it's not as confusing and I don't have to get into all those crazy names that I can't pronounce and all this kind of stuff, right? If anybody tries to convince you of that, then say, well, if you don't believe in the Old Testament, then you don't believe in Jesus because Jesus believed in the Old Testament, right? Um, and, and if you think you're, you're too, like, you know, Christian to study the Old Testament, then I guess you're uh, too Christian to know Jesus. Um, but Jesus... Explain himself through what had taken place all the way back in the Old Testament. What happened in, in Moses' life and what happened through the prophets. And he explains himself to them. Verse 28. And as they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. So all this amazing thing had just taken place. You know, he asked, he's asking them these questions playing dumb. And then all of a sudden he like barks, <laughs> barks back at them and says, come on, you idiots. <laughs> Forgive me if you don't like that language, but come on. I mean, what did he say here, right? Do you think he really said, how foolish are you? <laughs> guys, how foolish have you been right now? He'd be like, come on, guys, boneheads, right? Goofballs, right? He, he, you know, he called, he's like, don't you get it, man? Right? And he scolds him, and then he's like, all right, I'm gone. Peace. <laughs> he's like, I'm going on. He's like, he was going as if he were going to keep walking, Right? I love that. You know what I love about Jesus? I love that he, he showed up and he was ready to continue going. He wanted to go show up to somebody else. And he wanted to plant seeds of faith at some, in some other person's life, right? And you know what I love about that? I had a conversation with somebody recently this week that was like painfully distressed over the fact that one of his friends was not receptive to the gospel, Oh, man, I've been trying, and, and I can't believe how the way he treats me. And, and, man, all I do is nothing but good. And I just want to tell him about Jesus, and I can't believe he just wants to live that lifestyle. And, and man, it's killing me inside. And I said, hey, the, the way that you're feeling right now, and you're so beat down and broken over it, I was like, how many people today have you been able to demonstrate the light of Christ to today? Well, not that many, man, because I'm just so bummed out about that other guy. I said, so that guy's uh, an inability to receive what you're giving him has caused you to be ineffective to everybody else around you. Because you're so worried about one person that is not pushing out. I love it. Jesus, I never see Jesus begging anybody to follow him in the scriptures. Jesus goes, follow me. You want to? Yeah, come. No, I'm still moving. I got places to go. I'm not going to wait here around all day. Right? I, I, I never seen Jesus in the scriptures beg anybody to follow him. In fact, he would say, follow me. And then they'd say, oh, you know what, Jesus? I got to go do some stuff. I got to bury my dad because, you know, he's, uh, you know he, he passed away. And Jesus is like, all right, well, you know what? Go ahead and do that. I'm going to be moving on. So if you want to come back and catch up with me, go ahead. But let the bed, dead bury their dead. And, and we got work to do. And, and Jesus, you know, would call people. And then, you know, for instance, a rich person, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells them, go and sell everything you have. And then come follow me. And the guy's like, man... I can't do that. And so Jesus is like, all right, peace. Not that he doesn't care, but you got to move. I mean, Jesus, he showed up here to these two guys, and then he's like, I got other people to show up to. Right? And so I love that about Jesus. And so I, I was kind of encouraging my friend with that that, was, that I was talking with, and I said, hey, you know what? Pray for your friend. Minister to them. But you know what? There's somebody else around you that needs to know about the Lord, and, and, and don't let yourself be taken all the way down completely into the dirt. Right? In that situation, you got to continue moving forward, brother. And Jesus moved forward, right? Jesus would continue. He's like, all right, peace, guys. You know, work it out. <laughs> and then, they, but, but watch verse 29. But it says, but they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So they begged Jesus. So Jesus, they were like, Jesus, come on. Oh, they didn't know his name was Jesus at this point yet. But they were like, hey, guy, please stay with us. You know, it's getting late. It's getting dark. Let's just, you know, stay with us for a little while. We'll eat together and stuff. Um, and so, uh, 
So he went in to stay with them. Verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he blessed, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. Right? Let me read that one more time. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he blessed and broke it, and he gave it to them. You know? So if they hadn't recognized that this was Jesus up until that point, you guys ever prayed with somebody that you know, that, that you've heard them pray before? Right? Um, you know it's them when they start. If, 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 I, if I show up in a particular time and all of a sudden I just hear my dad starting to pray, I know that it's my dad. Nobody prays like my dad, right? He prays a particular way. I know it. And in this particular moment here, all of a sudden, you know, whether they hadn't recognized that it was Jesus up to this point, when he sat down and he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them, they're like, oh, man, there's only one person who did it like that. There's only one person I remember who blessed bread and, and who, who passed it out this way. That's Jesus. So either you, you, are, you are him or you know him or who are you, man, by the way. <laughs> right? And then all of a sudden, watch what happens here. <laughs> then their eyes were open, verse 31, and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. It was Jesus, right? And they're like, whoa! So they're tired. They're like, you know, they've been walking, they've been talking, they get to this spot, they're ready to eat, they're hungry, and all of a sudden they recognize that this is Jesus. And just imagine what was going in, in, in their minds, what was going on in their minds and in their hearts at this time. Verse 32 kind of gives us a little explanation as to what that was. It says this, They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? While he was opening the scriptures to us? I love that verse. Let me read it one more time. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? While he was opening the scriptures to us. Remember, he wasn't carrying any scriptures with him, church. When he was opening the scriptures, then that means he was explaining God's word to them, and he was doing it from memory. That means he knows God's word. That means he was so steeped in the teachings of God's word that he was able to recite them in passing as he was walking with these two guys. That's significant for us as believers, as the body of Christ, to be familiar with God's word. Right? Uh, it's significant for us. If we base our whole faith upon this book, then why would we treat this as less significant than the manual we use that teaches us how to do our job at work? I mean, we know that thing backward and forward, right? You get fired if you don't know your manual at work. Well, well wh- wh- why shouldn't we treat God's word as something that's as significant, if not even way more significant? Jesus knew the word of God. He opened it to them, right, on the, on the road. But they said, we're, we're not our hearts burning within us. We're not our hearts burning within us. And I love that. That's the best way that they could describe how they were feeling when they were walking and talking to this man they didn't recognize. But they said something was happening in us that only happened whenever we heard this one person preaching, and that was when Jesus was preaching. And that was happening in us, man. Weren't you feeling that? And they were like, yeah, I was. You were too? Wow, that's crazy. How many of us had our hearts inside when you know the presence of Christ and he's right there? Something starts to take place in your soul, right? And you recognize, man, I'm in the presence of God. I'm in the presence of truth. I'm in the presence of grace. I'm in the presence of love like I've never experienced before. And that's what it's like to be in the presence of Jesus. When's the last time you felt that, church? Or has your relationship with Jesus just turned into a a, a sequence of events that you do weekly or daily? Or is it still a relationship? The kind of relationship that would burn within our hearts when we're in the presence of Christ. I know that I've been there, and I hope that you have as well. It burned something in them, and they were sharing that with one another. And that same hour, verse 33, that same hour they got up and they returned to Jerusalem. And they found, so it was dark, right? Because remember, they asked Jesus to stay with them because it was getting dark. And so it was already nighttime, and they turned around and went straight back to Jerusalem. That's a lot of running that's going on on this first Sunday, right? When Jesus got up. You know, as we read the story on Sunday, on Easter, we, we saw that, you know, there was running happening. You know, uh, the, the women went to the tomb. They found it empty. They ran to the disciples. Then the disciples ran down to the tomb. And, 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 and the way that we get this story is there's a lot of, why is that? Why is that? It's a sense of urgency, church. They're eager to witness. They're eager to share Christ with one another. They're eager to go to their brothers and sisters and tell them that Jesus is alive. And my question for us is, are we still eager that other people would know that Jesus is alive? Or are we like, oh, you know what, it's cool for me, but you know, my neighbor probably doesn't really care, or my coworker, or anybody else. You know, if they find Jesus, you know, good, good for them. 
you know. I'll, I'll drop a tract in their front driveway or something on my way to work. But I don't really care if they know Jesus or not because it's not about them. It's about, you know, I'm just going to focus on my own life and, and my own relationship with Jesus. I can't worry about other people. You know, have we, have we turned our faith into this thing that's just about what's going on here rather than looking at scriptures and recognizing that when, when the disciples realized that Jesus was alive, they had to run and tell somebody that Jesus is alive, right? When's the last time we felt that? That urgency, that desire to say, you know what? Hey, do you know that Jesus loves you, man, and he's alive and wants to live in your life? Because I want to let you know something. If you, church, who are sitting here in the house of God, think that that's only the job of pastors to do, then, then we got it wrong, church. It's our responsibility. Not just our responsibility, but it's a response, right? They couldn't hold it in. They're like, let's go back to Jerusalem. And they get it, and they book it back, right? These guys are running. They probably got tired, man. I don't know if they were in shape or not. I would be tired. Seven miles? Shoot. I get tired after like a mile and a half, and that's a slow pace. And these guys are running, right? They're running back, and, and um, they found the 11, and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made, made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The last point I want to make before we dismiss. Um, what a wonderful story, right? I mean, it's long. Like, I read the whole thing to you tonight. So that's like 13 to 35. That's a lot of verses dedicated to this story between Jesus and these two disciples. You want to know something crazy? This is chapter 24, the last chapter. In fact, we only have probably like, if you want to read the rest of Luke, there's only from verse 36 all the way to verse 53, and then it's done. So we're almost at the end of the Gospel of Luke, the last chapter. Not once... In Luke 1 through 23 are these two disciples mentioned. We don't even know who they are. This guy, one of the guys, we get one of the guy's names is Cleopas, and then we don't even know the other guy's name. And they never showed up, at least in the scriptures, up until this point. The reason why I believe that is significant for us here tonight is simply this. Uh, Jesus doesn't always show up, right, to the person that we expect for him to show up to. You know, you would think that spending this much time, chunk of time in the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke, that he would show up to somebody like Peter and do this amazing thing or show up to one of the other prominent disciples that we had already read about, but instead he shows up to two anonymous disciples. In other words, the heart of, heart of Jesus was always like that. And he would show up and he would transform a, a lame person, a blind person, a, a leper, a paralytic, and he would radically transform them. And, and they were the least likely, right? They were the least likely to receive a blessing from God, right? But Jesus showed up to the ones that were the least of these, the ones that were least likely to, to be expected to carry the good news of Jesus Christ. And I want to let you know here tonight, church, that whether it's you or whether it's somebody that you know that God is working on, that God right now is probably doing the same thing he's been doing, which is he's looking for a couple more anonymous disciples to show up to. He's looking for somebody that doesn't think they're worth, you know, Jesus' time. He's looking for somebody who, who, who might, in the world standards, not, might not be considered great by any stretch, but he's going to show up, just like he showed up to these two. Man, it's the fi- one of the final stories of Scripture, and he shows up to two nobodies, and he turns them into somebodies, right, so that they can go and share the news back with the disciples that Jesus is alive. Amen.